I got pulled over by the police. And I thought, oh, God, was I speeding? And Well, I basically started chatting to them, and they just wanted to know about the car because they hadn't seen one before. Yes, I think it's it's obviously another ball in the air, but it's not. I doubt they're going to be pulling people off the Formula One program in order to run their new Le Mans car. Every single person that goes there is blown away by what you see, whether that's Richard Petty or uh, your average punt. Max Verstappen is a very worthy champion. He he won more races. He drove he drove brilliantly. You know there were moments of of it not quite going right. Um, but I do think Lewis Hamilton was robbed of a championship there. Um, and how he will ever get over that, I don't know. Hello and welcome to your favourite podcast in the world. It's Stripping the Dipping and you're joined by your usual dynamic duo of F1 Black and I, AMG Dent, Denzel Clarkson. And we hope that everyone's keeping safe and enjoying this very fiery hot summer that we have right now in the UK and across the world as well. But I'll kickstart this episode with a really fiery quote from the legendary Graham Hill who once said... I am an artist, the track is the canvas, and my car is the brush. And I'm sure our special guests will have taken a very similar view into the insightful and engaging articles and things they've been able to present over the years that they've been engaged. So without no further delay, we're very happy to give a warm welcome to our special guest, Ed Foster. Ed, how are you keeping at the moment? I know that we were chatting backstage and having the obligatory conversation, as F1 Black said, about this excruciating uh, hot conditions we have at the moment. But generally speaking, how, how are you doing at the moment? Yeah, very good, thanks. Very good. Um, looking forward to this hour. Uh, I, um, I'm obviously usually on the other side of the mic, as it were. So actually talking about myself is, is not something I tend to do much. So I'm intrigued to know where we'll end up down too many rabbit warrens because that's usually where i end up uh, well we don't mind the rabbit holes either ed and you know it's great <laughs> as well because we have so many different people with a variety of different backgrounds but it's also great you know just to get into the people like you that have a profession have something which you know it's quite linked to, to how we see and digest you know motorsport and how we experience it so before we get into a deep dive ed of just like your history kind of what you're doing career-wise as well you know we we know that you've worked with motorsport magazine you've obviously had a stint as well with the italian media and the italian version of autocar and then oh man like i'm really jealous of your cv man like you've even <laughs> had this current kind of involvement with uh, the goodwood festival of speed much loved event that happens you know kind of in and around this all what is amazing about motor racing and classic cars modern day cars as well but for our listeners at home could you give them a synopsis as to who the real Ed Foster is and what were your earliest motorsport memories and motor racing memories growing up? Yeah, so I suppose I'd, I'm like a, um, a lot of motorsport fans in that my dad was into motor racing and he used to race himself. And I, I remember vaguely kind of going to races with him um, and I, to kind of help, but I don't think I did any help at all. I basically sort of got snot and ice cream on his car. <laughs> and um, uh, sort of lost spanners for him and things like that. But I remember because he used to race uh, um, his 1948 Simca Gordini and it was uh, famously fragile and it didn't have much power. So as someone like Monaco, it was really good. And then I think he won in Copenhagen on a little sort of triangular circuit. Um, but invariably, just one lap, he wouldn't come around. And actually, he, he was contacted by a French guy he wanted to buy the car off him. And by that time, he'd kind of, he'd sort of done the races he wanted to do. And my brother and I could not fit into it because it's a tiny, tiny little car. And uh, so this Frenchman ended up buying it. And he called him about three weeks later. He said, John, I've, I've, I'm at Silverstone. The car's broken. My dad said, well, you know, um, how many laps have you done? He said, I've done 10 laps. And then that's it. It's broken. And my dad said, well, it's twice as many as I ever managed in that car at that circuit. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah, and then we, we spent a long time uh, at the workshop kind of, uh, you know, playing with cars and, and bits and pieces. And I kind of knew I wanted to do something with motorsport. And it just happened that as I finished university, this job in Italy came up through a kind of friend of a friend of a friend. And they were looking for a, a British person who could learn Italian 
and work as the kind of British link in the Italian office for Autocar. Um, and the proviso was I had to start writing in Italian in six months or something. Um, and the pay was pretty terrible. Um, but it was amazing. It was the first kind of foot on the ladder. So it was, it was great. Because back then, I suppose it was before podcasts, before social media. So making me sound quite old. But, you know, that that was the only way to get your foot in the door was to get a job on a magazine, whatever it be, or sweeping the floors. As, as long as you get in the door, then that was the main thing. I can imagine, you know, and talking on that as well, Ed, just, you know, just how it was in the earlier days of journalism and working for magazine companies as well when it came to, you know, delivering these stories. I wanted to take the opportunity to ask you just like, what are your favorite uh, YouTube channels or podcasts or content creators just in this space generally? And, and also just from your perspective, how do you see the change in the way in which, you know, consumers like myself and, and the guys here, they, they kind of like take in kind of the stories and stuff like that too. Cause as you mentioned back in the day, it was magazines. I remember my dad, you know, bringing home a, a magazine. I'm not going to give away the name cause they don't sponsor us, unfortunately, but they had like a red backdrop and a white writing and the name starts with A so it should be a dead giveaway to most but uh, yeah you would either sit down and read that or you know um, also probably giving away my age too you had teletext back in the day as well so you'd log on to teletext and you'd get like a little inside scoop of what was happening and we even had like I think Bruce Jones a GT3 commentator on here previously just talking about like life in the paddock and having to like live and breathe some of the stories you know before putting pen to paper and translating that you know to the wider audience so how do you see the, the the kind of like the development and the movement away from kind of hard paper kind of um, magazines to now the kind of wide variety of different things such as podcast, YouTube reviews and, and stuff like this too in the way that they're perceived? Yeah, so I, cause I did 12 years at magazine, so two at Autocar, uh, Autocar Italia and then 10 at Motorsport. So I've, I've got a soft spot for printed kind of copy. Um, and I've got motorsport magazines from 1950 to present. Uh, and I've got them all up on my shelves in my office. Um, and I love that kind of feeling of sitting down in the magazine. Um, that said, you know, any books I read nowadays, I read them on my phone. <laughs> so I can't, I can't get too off my high horse about uh, liking the paper copy. Um, the, I think what I find interesting is I love the breadth of content you get now. And it suits so many more people. Um, sometimes you haven't got 20 minutes to sit down and read three magazine articles. Sometimes you've got kind of a couple of minutes at a bus stop and, you know, you can still kind of consume content. And the only thing I would say, I think there is, there's a lot of noise out there now. Um, and you do, I, I find myself, you know, scrolling through the Facebook feed and you pause and you're like, why, why am I two minutes into watching someone like power hose their driveway? You know, this is just, I'm not gaining anything from this. Um, so there is a balance somewhere. And I think for me that I, I love video content. I love podcasts because I, I, I did podcasts for a long time at motorsport and then some at Goodwood. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the printed version, but I always think unless I'm learning something new, um, I uh, sort, of, sort of switch off a bit. So I, I like, you know, being informed or finding out something new, whether that's do with motorsport or the local paper or, or whatever it is. Um, but I think that's a reasonably good barometer and it tends to stop you watching completely mindless stuff as you're kind of wasting time in the evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely see that perspective as well. Though. Um, <laughs> I'll tag team my uh, fellow friend F1 Blag into the conversation too, Blag. Um, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Ed, good to uh, good to speak. Um, I'm here in my in my own office, but I think it's about 10 degrees hotter uh, down here from where you are. Um, you, you mentioned being at Autocar Italia uh, for a little while. Um, and something that I've never really comprehended uh, is the difference between motorsport in Italy versus motorsport in Britain. So as someone that sort of lived both, um, do you have a sense of sort of the difference between the fans and, and the difference between the way the media operates there and and indeed the teams? We, we yeah. kind of, the reason I ask, we look at uh, Ferrari and sometimes you might think, you know, there's a bit of a, you know, maybe I'm being rude, a clownish, um, you know, quality sometimes, uh, but it might just be me being unfair. So yeah, what, what are the main differences that you've perceived? Yeah, so I think um, in terms of the media, uh, 
you know, every Italian is a Ferrari fan. Um, I, that's obviously a very broad brush, but um, there's the, the main kind of sport newspaper, like La like Gazzetta dello Sport, is um, doesn't put any punches. And if you're Ferrari and you don't perform, the, the worst reaction you are going to get is from the Italian media. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty full on. Whereas, you know, if Hamilton and Mercedes don't win a race or aren't performing very well, you just don't really see it in the newspapers here. Um, I think that, that it all goes back to kind of people's attitude of cars and motorsport. And I find in the UK, if you can live in quite a sort of closeted environment, you can go to Goodwood and everyone loves cars and you chat cars. It's great. But wider world, there's not a huge percentage of British people who love cars. Um, and more and more, they're sort of seen as a kind of slightly dirty thing. You shouldn't be driving. And um, whereas in Italy, they love cars, especially nice cars. And I, um, uh, I remember I borrowed a Ferrari uh, in London um, off the press office. I think it was the 458 when that first came out. And I was driving it back into London. Um, and I stopped at some traffic lights and it was an open top. And this van driver just leant out swore at me <laughs> and i said it's not even my car <laughs> and he just he basically just called me all a whole number of names for just driving a ferrari whereas in italy i uh, was very lucky i went around the lamborghini factory and um afterwards the guy showed me around said look do you want to take a car out i said well, i'd love to and there was the um aventador soft top and he said look we programmed a route in don't worry about the police we've got an agreement with them uh and just follow the route and have fun and it was the most amazing drive up into the hills. And I remember I went into this little village and I drove past a school and all the kids were on break time and every single kid ran to the fence and cheered as I drove past because they just loved Lamborghinis and they just thought they were the coolest thing in the world. Um, and it's just, it's almost polar opposite to the UK when people basically, if you drive, if you drive a modern supercar, you tend to get a pretty fr frosty rece reception on the road. Um, whereas in Italy, they love it and they're interested. They want to take photos. Um, I remember I'd, I was in the in the Nissan 350Z when that first came out, and I was going down the Autostrada down to Bologna, and I got pulled over by the police. And I thought, oh god, was I speeding? And well, I basically started chatting to them, and they just wanted to know about the car because they hadn't seen one before. And eventually, they said, um, "How fast is it going?" I said, well, I, "I don't know. I, I've, I've literally just started driving it." They said, well, let's find out. Follow us. And so I was going down the outside lane of the motorway with the police car in front of me with its lights flashing and me trying to keep up with it. And eventually about 140 miles an hour or something, I wimped out and, um, and pulled off the motorway. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a different world in terms of cars. But if you're an Italian team and not performing, I wouldn't want to read the reviews in, um, in their sport paper. Yeah, it, uh, your your comments on that and Ferrari remind me of I think it was '99 at Suzuka where Eddie Irvine could have won the first Ferrari World Drivers Championship in ten year, uh, twenty years, and they only brought three tires out to the uh, pit stop, uh, and I think there were a few tires left around Maranello uh, by disgruntled fans. <laughs> such was their disgust. <laughs> yeah, I know, and I think um, I haven't. I'd, I'd be interested to see what the kind of Italian media is making of this year because. It's sort of a Ferrari at the moment. Well, I think Ferrari on and off, you know, they are a brilliant team, but I do find as though they're kind of one of those rugby teams that just as they're about to score a try, they knock it on. Um, mm. And uh, I don't know whether that, that was ironed out. Well, certainly that wasn't such a big thing when it was Jean Todd in control with Ross Braun, um, Michael Schumacher, and that kind of trio that sort of took over Ferrari. And one of the deals I think they had was that, you know, back to Ferrari, the, the company, don't get involved, don't meddle, and we'll sort this. Um, and they had it running really well, but I just, I, I don't know, I just slightly feel that they've been very unlucky with engine failures. Um, well, unlucky, or that, you know, they've, you know, their engine is, is a weak engine. Um, but you just slightly feel that they, they are good, they're quite good at um, you know, clutching uh, defeat from the jaws of victory. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. I mean, it, it, it's not that long ago before sort of Jean Todd arrived at Ferrari, but the number of people that you sort of come across online that perhaps re can remember Ferrari before the Schumacher era is, is limited. So um, I, I've probably come to the conclusion in the last month or two that 
Ferrari with Schumacher, Todd and Braun was the anomaly. And that either side of that is probably the natural, I don't know if there is a natural culture, maybe that's it. I mean, we, yeah. go on, yeah, go on. No, sorry, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I suppose it depends how far back you go. Cause you know, if you rewind to the fifties and sixties, you know, Ferrari was sort of all concrete um, until uh, when sports cars in the sixties, they were brilliant, but uh, you know, they just, they have I, resting on their laurels in the sense that, you know, Enzo Ferrari, when he first saw the Cooper um, with the end in the back, I think he came out with the phrase of, no, no, the horses always draw the carriage. You don't put the horses behind the carriage. And it was kind of this quite archaic view and sort of not, and it was all about the engine. It's always been about the engine with Ferrari. And mm. um, I, you know, I mean, just ask Toyota how hard it is to, to win in Formula One. But, and so I think you saying Schumacher era was the anomaly, you know, the facts kind of say that's exactly what it, what it is really. And, you know, they won a lot of championships, but not, so they've all lost a lot as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll jump around a bit, but you did bring up this, this season in, in Formula One. And of course, we'll talk about many other things, but do you get the sense that the Ferrari has on quite a few occasions been the faster package or... Or yeah, is it I think so. I mean, in, yeah, I, I think it's very tight. I, th I think Ferrari is is a faster race car, uh, on, or has been on a number of occasions. Um, I would be surprised if Ferrari win the World Championship. I hate making Formula One predictions because someone will listen to this <laughs> in a year's time and be saying, "What an idiot!" Um, so I uh, try not to. But you know, Red Bull um, seem to be a more efficient championship winning machine. Um, mm. And Verstappen is at the sort of height of his game. But Sergio Perez is, 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 is doing better than Alex Albon did or, you know, previous teammates in the sense that he can actually work with the team because he's in the right place on the track rather than back mm. in seventh or something. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's still too early in the season, but I would be surprised if, if Ferrari were neither of the championships. Um, I'd, one of the things that amazed me is that obviously Mercedes, I think, have obviously have slightly been playing down, you know, how bad their car was, how difficult it's been to sort. But, you know, they're, they're there or thereabouts now. Um, mm. And whilst it's too little, too late, I would have thought for this year, unless Ferrari and Rebel have an absolute shocker. Um, I, it's amazing how they've managed to turn that round and just kind of get back to, you know, roughly on the leader's pace. Yeah, I, I was going to say for our 2023 listeners, you know, who would have thought that Lewis Hamilton would come back from where he was to win the World <laughs> yeah. Championship like that? Um, what a, what yeah, a superb yeah. turnaround. Yeah, um, um, brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I, we didn't bully you into offering a uh, prediction. So thanks for sort of... No, 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 that's all right. I'm, I'm perfectly capable of hanging myself. <laughs> yeah, I, I, a quick question before Dens comes back in. I mean, you talked a bit about the turnaround going on at um, Mercedes and, you know, the technical side of things. You, you, I'm sure, see cars from every era. Do you think that the modern fan really gets how difficult it is, even if you've got a beautiful car, to set it up, let alone to develop it, like the technical side? No, how would you I don't, yeah. yeah, I think you... Um, uh, I think you obviously you get engineers and all people who are aspiring to be engineers and they sort of have a better understanding of it. But, um, you know, it's a bit like me saying, you know, me saying, oh, I understand German just because I speak a few words, just because I understand elements of engineering does not mean I understand a Formula One car. Um, I think a lot of journalists are quite nervous about saying, oh, no, 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 I, I don't really understand all the int in intricacies of it, because that's basically then admitting that they don't know how to do their job. The problem is they are so complicated now and it's all secretive. You know, yes, mm. you can um, uh, take photos, you can look at the flips and the curves and, you know, if you've got an, an aerodynamic kind of background, you can kind of see the direction of um, that they're trying to go in. But the wonderful thing about um, the Lansby Records car, the Bloodhound, they released everything. So it was this amazing engineering tool. Um, and uh, because they weren't really, you know, they didn't really have a direct competitor. Whereas Formula One is so secretive that actually young people who want to learn about the engineering, there's a limit to what they can actually learn about a Formula One car. But they are, I mean, unbelievably complicated. So, you know, it, as you say, even just getting it set up right, um, 
and then once you layer the setup with the actual time, the aerodynamics had how the driver works, how the tires work, then you got the race strategy, then you got what other cars are doing on top. So I always find it quite amusing when people say, Oh, yeah, no, well, you know, Sergio Perez drove a pretty average race. He probably didn't. You know, it's if you had all the facts, you might actually find out that it was one of his best races he's ever done. So um, yeah, I think Formula One is overly complicated now, especially with the hybrid end. Um, I'm looking forward to the uh, the um, the fuel change they're doing in 2026 because I think that would be very interesting to see how they run on synthetic fuels and how that might like flow into road cars and how we use um, our classic cars as well. Actually, because I do think synthetic fuels are are, are yeah quite important for our future. But yeah, Formula One, it's it's so complicated. I think for the average viewer, you've just got to kind of dis- you've got to discard a lot of the noise and just enjoy the show. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that one, Ed. And I'm going to tag back in from Black. Um, and on the topic of that as well, I just wanted to get your thoughts too. On um, we recently at the weekend saw the unveiling and kind of a teaser from Ferrari, just with a separate project that they're they're working on. It's a new hypercar they have for the uh, the LMH class for the prototype series of the World Endurance Championship. Uh, a kind of question we got in from the fans is just um. Do you see Ferrari's like interest in maybe other spec series as a distraction from their main bread and butter series being F1? And on top of that as well, do you think it's kind of normal in a, in a sense, like a trend that we're seeing these manufacturers like Ferrari and such um, push for kind of more sustainable and renewable forms of uh, mobility through challenging themselves for these series? Yeah, so I, I mean, the... Um... It's interesting you saying odds the uh, you know is, is it going to distract Ferrari from Formula One and, and things like that. That was one of the big bones of contention that John Surtees always had with Ferrari was that they wouldn't just concentrate on Formula One. They you know the sports car would delay the Formula One car, which would delay the sports car. And I think times are different now. Um, yes, I think it's it's obviously another ball in the air, but it's not. I doubt they're going to be pulling people off the Formula One program in order to run their new Le Mans car. Um, Personally, I'm so excited about this new kind of era. I, th- I think you can call it a new era. Um, and having all these manufacturers in, because whilst it's great having privateers and things like that, you need the manufacturers building cars. And one of the most exciting things is just not, it's not just the number of manufacturers. Um, it's the fact that they've got to supply customer teams at a set price. Um, and they, the customer team will get the factory car or that. So, you know, it'd be a bit like, you know, the Porsche 956, 962 era, when if Porsche stumbled, then one of their privateer teams would still win in a Porsche 962. Um, but I just think it's, Le Mans great because there's, there's different classes, different speeds, and it's the variation that's wonderful. But, you know, let's all be honest, despite everyone saying, oh, the LMP2 battle has been the most exciting, you know, one to watch in previous years, it's to see the battle for the lead. You know, having having a two cars basically from the same manufacturer fighting it out over 24 hours is not that interesting. Even if you've got a great LMP2 category, a great GT category, but you know, AM and Pro this year, and that's obviously finishing this year. But um, yeah, I, I think the new era will be will be fascinating. I going on to kind of other points. The you know the the future of you know these. I did, what, how did you phrase your question? Sorry, because you asked about whether or not it's going to kind of trickle into the road cars. Yeah, because I mean, and probably what I'll do to supplement that point as well, Ed, is that, you know, we, we've we seen quite a few adventures and experiments been run recently. Like with, uh, I would like to also bring up Sebastian Vettel and, you know, him running Nigel Mansell's uh, Red 5 uh, Williams car at the Silverstone event too on like um, bio kind of, um, you know, renewable fuels and also we're seeing as well mercedes with their kind of project one car and other kind of a bigger manufacturers trying to like build essentially street legal like race cars that have a lot of technology that would enter yeah i mean i so i find uh the kind of the these sort of supercars quite interesting in the fact that, that you can't you can drive them on the road obviously but actually there's no point in having anything faster than the Volvo or like a, a BMW 320D or whatever it is. Because actually on 
the normal roads, in order to drive a, a BMW 320D on the limit on a B road, you've got to be going well over the speed limit. Um, so, you know, the, the technology, even just a normal saloon nowadays with the tires, the like very clever suspension and dampers. And um, so I always find these kind of super, super cars, especially like the Mercedes, sort of quite interesting because it's such a small market. Because, you know, how are you going to have fun with that on the road? You basically, you can drive it around and sit in traffic and have people point at you and, and take photos. Great. But actually to experience what that car can do, you need to be able to track. Um, you've, you know, you, as you say, you've, you've got a supercar with a Formula One engine in it. Um, and I find it quite interesting because, that you know, a lot of it is going down the hybrid route. There's a lot of electric supercars now. Uh, there's an electric um, pickup truck um, that was at uh, the Festival of Speed that was unbelievably quick. Um, and uh, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next two years. Because I am probably in a bit of a minority in that I don't believe electric cars are the way forward at all. Um, but uh, please don't hate me for that. It's just a, a a worry I have. Well, I don't think many people would have a right to hate you for that one, Ed. And actually, I'd, like, I'd invite you almost to kind of explain why you, you don't think it's the future. Because I would be in your camp too, thinking that in some countries, in some districts, in some boroughs, the infrastructure is not quite there, but that's kind of my reasoning. Is the kind of reasoning you have for why it's no, not really... so, Well, I mean, it's going back to the sort of the very basics of it. Um, fuel that you burn is is a very clever way to power a car or a mobile object because as you burn it, you get rid of the weight. Whereas with batteries, you've got the weight the whole time. So whether you've got one percent charge or one hundred percent charge, you're still carrying around that extra weight. And batteries are very, very heavy. I know technology moves on and they will get lighter, but they're extremely heavy. There's no getting around that. Actually, what we should be doing is either using clean fuel or less fuel. Um, and by adding weight, you're using more fuel, as it were. My uh, second problem with batteries is that there are holes, you know, enormous holes where people are digging for lithium, digging it out of the ground. You then basically build these batteries, but what happens to them? When they're finished no one's no one's ever i'm sure there might be something out there but no one's ever been able to tell me what happens to these car batteries when they're finished people say oh you can use them in your house i've never met anyone who's used them in their house i've met people who've got electric cars and done quite a lot of miles and had to replace the batteries so are we just going to be dumping these into the ground um which sort of looks like it at the moment and then i think one of the main ones is where the electricity comes from. So uh, Volvo did a, a survey. Well, they did a kind of investigation into that. Uh, there's one of their cars that has, a, I think it's the V40 or something, that has a, an electric version and a fuel-powered version. And if you were to charge your electric version off totally green energy, it would still take 30,000 miles in that Volvo before it was greener or had a less, less of a carbon footprint than the fuel-powered version. Um, Obviously, that would improve as more and more electric cars are built. Um, but if you were to charge that off the UK mains at the moment, the split between fossil fueled electricity and green electricity, you'd have to do 70,000 miles in your electric car before it was greener than the fuel powered one. So there's those. And then the final ones, um, uh, this it's this whole thing of getting new cars every two years or trading it in and upgrading and that's the worst thing you can do because a lot of the carbon footprint comes from building the car. Um, and uh, that doesn't help at all. Um, and also the last point is that we're just binning a hundred years or more of internal combustion engine development. So the, the modern Formula One engines are amazingly efficient, incredibly efficient. They are, you know, what, what they might be able to manage in another 20 years is almost mind boggling. And if we can make synthetic fuels, which we, do, we already do, they're just £10 a litre. But if we can make them in bulk and get the price down, um, then uh, I just see that as a much easier way to solve the problem. Electric cars, which I just, I just don't see. I'm sure there are lots of people out there with electric cars um, who are disagreeing with me. And I apologise. But that is just, um, those are my thoughts on the matter. I think those like are very going through the window.
<laughs> <laughs> no, Ed, I think Queen's Jamaica are very reasonable, and I think they stand for a lot of things which could be improved or maybe need to be looked at much deeper. I think as well, even just for the normal consumer, or like normal person that's not a petrol head like you or I, you know, just with the cost of living crisis that's happening at the moment and the cost of electric and stuff too, it does beg the question how, how you know if they want to push this particular thing on people with electric fired uh, vehicles that's one thing but to make it sustainable to make it worthwhile to make it affordable for people is something that needs further consideration like you said and whilst we have the combustion engine whilst we found ways to make it more efficient maybe we need to be looking more at that than necessarily trying to reinvent the wheel again as you mentioned so i think that's a fair point and actually kind of to segue into another topic ed because uh, i know this is your, your bread and butter as well goodwood Fe uh, festival of speed which again is such an incredible event and i'd implore people to go including myself because i've never been but uh how i'd like to kind of start this one ed is this, what is the history behind goodwood uh festival of speed how did it start and what if you're just like somebody new that was going to go there for the first time what could you expect to see there okay well I, i'll take the um the the last kind of point first it's the Goodwood Festival of Speed, they, Goodwood do three motorsport events through the year. One is the members meeting and the revival, and they're for historic racing cars. And then in June, July, Festival of Speed, which is the biggest motoring extravaganza you will ever see, you, you'll see anywhere in the world. Um, it's the biggest greenfield build site in the world it's on site it does it produces enough electricity to power the local town chichester um it is enormous uh, you, you know a couple of hundred thousand people over the four days um every single person that goes there is blown away by what you see whether that's richard petty or uh, your average punt and there's everything from modern formula one cars all the way through to the kind of the pioneers of motorsport on, you know the very early cars kind of 1903 1910 um all the way through touring cars rally cars there's the forest rally stage there's motorbikes there's off-road arena there's monster trucks there's drifters um there's supercars there's the manufacturers bring all their kind of uh you know future cars that their concepts um so it is really it's kind of a, a celebration of the past present and future of motoring and motorsport if that sort of Okay. Um, I think it sums up brilliantly. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yep. So, uh, but it basically, so Goodwood um, during the Second World War uh, became an airfield. There was an RAF West Hampton, which is basically right by Goodwood and owned by the, the, um, Freddie uh, Richmond, who was the du Duke of Richmond's grandfather. And after the war, they, well, during the war, it got very wet. So they put in this perimeter circuit to move the planes around if it was wet. And after the war, it was Tony Gaze, I think, who said to the Duke of Richmond, do you know what? This perimeter road might make quite a good circuit. So they opened up, um, opened it up as a circuit and they had their first meeting in September 1948. And then they ran loads of racing there all the way through to 1966 when it was closed, just because the circuit wasn't kind of meeting current standards and the cars were getting too quick. Um, and 66 was that, you know, Formula One's return to power. So they went from the 1.5 litre engines up to kind of much bigger engines um, and everything was getting a bit fast. So, but they had, you know, the, all the kind of big names raced there. The the lap records held jointly by Jackie Stewart and Jim Clark. Um, so they never had a World Championship Grand Prix, but they had plenty of Formula One races. Um, and they had, I think, one motorcycle race in period, maybe two. Um, anyway, so... The current Duke of Richmond was always keen to reopen the circuit, um, but it was going to be very difficult with planning. So they thought to test the water and see kind of whether there was still an interest in motorsport at Goodwood that they'd uh, do this little hill climb in front of the house. And I think they're, they spoke to the BARC, which is the British Automobile Racing Club, which is kind of the organising club. And they said, look, for something like this, you'll usually get three to 4,000 people. Um, so that's what they sort of bargained on. But actually, the first Festival of Speed in 1993, um, I think 25,000 people turned up. But they were never too sure how many because they actually broke the fencing down to get in. They ran out of tickets. Uh, so they were giving away, like, coat uh, numbers um, to people. They, they didn't have anywhere to store all the money. So they basically took all the women's handbags 
who worked there and filled them with cash. And then they were then putting them in the back of a boot, which was then driven off and kind of hidden. Um, and it's basically, it's grown exponentially since then, but it's, especially in those early years, you know, they sort of sourced kind of auto unions or lost cars uh, that were off in Eastern Europe and people saw them for the first ever time. It was, and then they had Formula One, you know, the sort of current Formula One teams turned up for the first time in 1994. And then Ferrari turned up for the first time in 1996. And it's just, it's grown to an enormous event. Um, and if you haven't been, as, as you guys haven't, you, you've just got to go and go for two days if you can, because there's so much to see. Um, the site is massive. You can spend an entire morning just wandering around the paddocks, not even getting to see the hill. So, um, yeah, it's it's I I love it. It's um, it's a very tiring kind of week for me, but it's great fun because it's it is the greatest names in the greatest cars and on the greatest bikes uh, in motorsport, um, and they're all in one place for a weekend during the summer. That's amazing, Ed. And like you said as well, it's like a huge extravaganza and it's amazing just to see, you know, the history and the kind of historic nature of just how it was began, how it started, the sort of cars where you could imagine being there back in its day. And then even now with the historic events that we get in the classic races that we still celebrate those things and we're still able to mix that with all of the new kind of technology and new ideas that you see being pioneered and actually another question i wanted to ask you before i tag my handy f1 black back in was um what did you make of some of the crazy innovations that we saw take part in this year's hill climb because we're just watching it from home on youtube i saw like a really crazy four transit electric super van which in a way almost kind of reminded me of um top gear where jeremy clarkson and i know um richard hammond and and you know me as well would go around the nurburgring with like um what was a transit van back in 2005 but then to see yeah. a fully electrified super van i was like this is crazy and then i think the real kind of headline act from this year's show had to be the McMurty Sperling as well, which for those at home thinking, what the hell is a McMurty Sperling? Please type it up because it's one of the most craziest looking things I think I've seen in, in recent times. But essentially a two electric motor twin fan monster that has active downforce are uh, capable of producing 2000 kilograms of downforce, which is nuts. That's like almost Formula One levels essentially. And it smashed the time uh well hill climb record as well and left a lot of people just scratching their heads and it was a really interesting year because we had like an electrified gt3 cup car try and have a go we had so many different participants but yeah could you give us some insight into some of the wacky and some of your favorite cars that were um, yes yeah, so the um the super van was really cool roman Dumas was driving that who used to hold the records driving the volkswagen idr um and so the, the Fords, this is Supervan 4, because there were three before it. And basically, the previous Supervans were all kind of vans with Formula One engines. Um, and this was the fourth one, which was obviously an electric one. Um, and it was very, very quick. But this, yeah, the McMurtry Spearling was amazing. And the, the incredible thing about that is that the fans basically suck the car onto the road so that you have two tons of downforce from zero miles an hour. So it could it could easily just stick itself to the roof, um, and I did ask one of the guys on the team. I said, "If you are you going to try it?" And they said, "We're going to we'll wait till we have two cars and then we'll try it with one of them." <laughs> um, but uh, it's, yeah, I mean Max Jules, because I was up in the top paddock interviewing drivers and and things when once they come up the hill, and both Alex Summers, who drove on Saturday, who was the who's um, very good to hill climber. Um, and Max Chilton, their eyes were wide um, just because it's just uh, monumentally fast. And anyone who's listening, just just Google it, McMurtry Spearling Goodwood, and you'll see the run. And it's it's extraordinary. Whether or not you like electric cars, it is amazing. It's And what's quite interesting about it is that as it goes up the hill, because it's not making a huge rack, you can actually hear the crowd and kind of gasping as it goes up. Um, and the wonderful thing about the electric cars for uh, hill climbs is they're perfect for hill climbing. You get power straight away. Um, and you can use, you know, all your power in, on a 1.1 uh, mile hill climb. Um, so they're 
well. So as you mentioned, the the um, Porsche electric Porsche that was very quick. Um, but in fact, they basically every year they have a shootout, and you every car that's invited can run in the shootout um, if it wants to. So you get this amazing breadth of cars. So you've got pre-war cars, you've got touring cars, you've got Le Mans cars, you've got an Indy car, all competing to do the fastest time up the hill. But this year, as you said, the Mercury Spearling was just um, amazing. It was it was another level. Uh, so yeah, now holds the outright and kind of full hill record at 39.081, I think. Um, that beat Roman Dumas at 39.9. And Nick Heidfeld held the official record for a long time uh, when he did 41.6. Yeah, in, in the MP413 yeah. in 1999. And the reason, so everyone gets quite rightly because it's basically he set the record at 41.6 in 1999. And they then stopped Formula One cars doing timed runs because it was just getting a bit dangerous. Um, and so that record stood for a long time. And then Romain Dumas, Loeb came to beat it in the Pikes Peak car. But part of the problem with that was that the car is obviously, the battery needs to last for Pikes Peak, which is much longer than the Goodwood Hill. And it, the weather wasn't perfect. So it was a little bit damp, but he still did pretty well in that. And then Roman Dumas came in the IDR and did a 39.9, um, but it wasn't on Sunday afternoon. And that's when the official record is set. So even though he went faster in practice, um, it was then wet on Sunday and he didn't beat the record. So Nick Heidfeld still held the official record, whereas Roman Dumas was the outright fastest time. Whereas now, nice and simple, McMurtry Spearling, beating everything. So, all nice and easy now. Exactly. No, it's so true. And actually, on the topic of which as well, Ed, like, we've talked about some of the fastest cars that have been up the hill, but I wanted to ask you as well before I tag uh, F1 Black back in, what's the wackiest or, like, most unorthodox car you've ever seen take part in the hill climb or just genuinely do, like, a demo run on the circuit or, like, a track? So, I've seen a dragster. That was pretty mental. Um, I've seen someone go, go up with a rocket on his back. (laughs) <laughs> uh, like a jet, jet engine, like a jet engine. It was he's called Jetpack Man, and he flew up the hill. Uh, and then, in terms of actual vehicles, the Kamaz truck. You know the trucks they use on the Dakar. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely mental. I mean, it's enormous, and it was sideways, and um, yeah, it's that. I mean, you get some amazing things coming up, but the I was I always quite like the weird and wonderful, um, and the Kamaz truck was pretty special. The Dakar, um, the Toyota Hilux, the Dakar car uh, this year was, I thought was quite cool because it's just, you know, it doesn't really share much with the Hilux at all. Um, it's just incredibly well engineered uh, and it's, they're enormous. You don't realize when you're watching the Dakar or something like that on TV how big these cars are. They're absolutely massive. Um, and then this year, one of the highlights was. Um, back on a on a motorcycle for the first time in 30 years i think or just about 30 years because he had that huge crash in 1993 that left him paralyzed from the chest down um but he got back on his championship winning motorcycle and rode up the hill with his right great rival kevin schwantz his mentor kenny roberts danny pedroza was there once and then also mick Doohan as well um and that was pretty special there were sort of grown men kind of crying at the top of the hill seeing that it was it was a special moment. I feel like I'm your target market for Goodwood, and I've never been, um, but it's absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, you were talking a little bit there about sort of trucks and, and vans going up hills. I, I was remembering, I'm sure I've seen a video of Alan Prost testing a, what is it, a Renault Scenic or something that they were developing in the early 90s. So so ho- hopefully that's been up the hill. Um, <laughs> a, a, really, a really basic question for you. So how, how would I go about um, sort of booking? Like, is it just going on the Goodwood website? Yeah, yeah. yeah go partner? to the Goodwood website. And uh, I don't think the dates or the tickets have been released yet for next year, but you mm. can get on a ticket alert thing so that as soon as they're released, you can you can buy tickets. Um, mm. uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, obviously, you know, I worked there full time for two years and now, you know, to help with the TV coverage. So I'm I'm as biased as you can get. You know, for, for if you're a motorsport fan or even just a car fan or a bike fan, um it's amazing it's you've you've got to go and do it because it's 
it's almost impossible to describe how big or cool an event it is. Um, so yeah, it's just just you've got to go along. So please, if we talk again in this at this time in a year and you haven't gone, I'll be very unimpressed. Yeah, <laughs> once once Lewis Hamilton's won the world championship and uh, of you course, know, yeah, in 2023. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I'll get. I'll sign up for the alert. And does it sell out? Is it kind of like the Glastonbury? Yeah, they do. Yeah, sport? yeah. No, they they sell out every year. I think. I think pretty much every Goodwood event, a uh, motorsport wise, the members meeting, revival, and festival speed all sell out ahead of time. So, um, yeah, it's it's definitely worth just just getting the tickets early and also sorting somewhere to stay because mm. um, that's always quite tricky. Uh, but they have camping on site, and you know, there's loads of options. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you've got to go along. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining taking some friends and maybe trying not to be stereotypically English, but um, slightly sort of with a less jovial tone. We saw at the Austrian Grand Prix um, a few weeks ago that um, you know there was some uh, accusations of uh, of abuse and uh, you know um, inappropriate behaviour, assault, even in in some cases. Could you um, sort of, I don't know if you've witnessed that in Formula One or is it whether it's a growing phenomenon in in motorsport more widely? Um, it's something that I've never personally experienced, but then I'm, I'm a man, um, fairly tall, um, you know, I d hopefully tend to get away with these sorts of situations. But is it something that you've kind of observed as a motorsport follower over the years or, or were you shocked to see? Um, yeah, I mean, I, do you know what I was... Um... I was shocked, but not that surprised, which is which is awful, um, mm. and just actually a pretty sound reflection on kind of where we're at. Um, I think uh, I think we are moving in the right direction, but there's just so much more work that needs to be done. Um, it's I, I, as like you, you know, I'm very lucky, but uh, I've, I've never kind of witnessed it and myself in in a Formula One paddock or a motor or a motor circuit or anything like that. Um, and I don't know whether that's because, you know, the, the kind of paddocks I go to now um, are kind of are pretty diverse and they're, you know, everyone's sort of pretty decent people, I always like to think. But, yeah, you hear these stories and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty, it's just terrible. I, I don't even, I've, I've been on the receiving end of a lot of abuse on social media. Um, on YouTube's a good one, actually, for abuse. And uh, I get a lot of abuse for my accent. And it's, you know, everyone's like, oh, you, you, you're posh and da 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 um, So I get a lot of abuse for that. And I tend to actually just reply to each comment. And invariably that gives them a bit like I'm very apologetic. But um, I always apply in a really friendly way. But yeah, I, I just think um, it was sad to hear about it on an, on an actual event because on social media, whilst it's completely wrong, it's been going on for a long time and it will continue to go on for a long time. People get abused because people can hide behind a made up username or, you know, they feel as though because they're sat at their desk at home, they can kind of just write, cause the, you know, write things that you would never say to someone to their face. Um, and social media is very, very bad at that. I've, I've had it on a very small scale compared to others. Uh, and it's just, it just annoys you. You just, you know, you just feel a bit helpless because what what can you do? Um, but to have it at a live event where someone was on face uh, was pretty shocking. I can't comment too much on it because I, to be fair, I don't know exactly what they said. I've seen the stories, but I don't actually know kind of what was said and to who, but it obviously happened. It's, it's, it just shouldn't. Um, so hopefully they do get a ban or, you know, some some kind of justice handed down to them. Yeah, I agree. Couldn't couldn't agree with you uh, more that we condemn that behaviour and um, hope that you know, particularly the Formula One paddock, which is attracting millions of new fans through Netflix and so on, is an inclusive place that everyone can feel uh, that they can enjoy themselves. Uh, and it seems uh, almost ridiculous that we have to kind of define that as a minimum acceptable uh, standard. Um, you, you talked a little bit there about sort of experiences on online and. Um, you know, I um, I started on Twitter just as a bit of a, a board at Christmas because, you know, my brain's usually occupied with work uh, and it was about sort of seven years ago. And I've definitely noticed um, a sort of change in the tone or, or you know, the, the frequency of, you know, people perhaps not being as pleasant 
um, you know, I did a lot of research for this, including going on your LinkedIn, Mr. Foster. And um, I didn't were, you the, I, were you the online editor just at the end of your time at Motorsport, or were you sort of looking at that online world right at the beginning? And do you, you know, could you elaborate I, a bit on what it was like at the beginning and how it changed? Yeah, so I, um, uh, I, I, to be honest, I haven't, I, I've totally forgotten I had a LinkedIn profile. Um, yeah, the, uh, so it's interesting. So I joined Motorsport in 2007. And I remember uh, sort of taking over the website because there was no one really sort of doing it. And it wasn't really a massive thing for motorsport at the time because obviously the print was the big thing. Um, and I, I remember very distinctly having a discussion with the managing director about whether or not we should start up a Twitter account. And um, there was lots of umming and ahhing about it. And like, you know, well, should, what, what kind of benefit? I, I worry it's going to be really content hungry with, you know, you're going to have to, you can't just do one tweet and walk away from it. Um, and I remember the conversation and it's funny. It's, I mean, it, it, well, it was a long time ago now, but um, it's, uh, it, you know, you used to get people who write into the magazine and I think motoring magazines are never short of people complaining. Um, uh, and there's lots of very passionate fans out there who may not agree with your take on something. Um and so we used to get people kind of writing in, but they were invariably kind of reasonably polite. And whilst they completely disagreed with what you were saying, they were quite sort of reasonably polite about it. Um, whereas politeness in many respects of today's society has just gone out the window. And no nowhere is more acute than that on social media. And I don't understand how people can be so rude to someone else. I, I genuinely find it shocking. Um, and there was one I saw, actually one, I interviewed Jamie Chadwick uh, last year's Festival of Speed. And we had a completely normal chat. I mean, it was only kind of 60 seconds because it was in the top paddock and all the interviews are quite short. And you ask them what they've driven up the hill, what it was like, uh, you know, what they're doing this season. And, the, you know, obviously at the time she was in W Series. And so we chatted about that. Anyway, I was searching for a tweet ages ago. So I put in Ed Foster Goodwood um, trying to find... I think it was a Daniel Ricciardo interview because my nephew wanted to see, uh, my young nephew wanted to see kind of me interviewing Daniel Ricciardo. But anyway, I couldn't find it. What I did find was this person who had basically, I, she obviously hated my interview with Jamie Chadwick and I don't even know what the problem was, but she even included a hashtag, um, Ed Foster is a fucking tool. <laughs> Sorry, you might have to beep that out. Um, and I was like... That seems a little harsh because <laughs> all I did was interview her. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't even a kind of, a, uh, I, I just did a normal interview. So, yeah, I, you don't get that in person. You don't get it when people write into letters, uh, write into magazines. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a brave new world. It's going to have to be regulated at some point. I know the social media platforms are kind of, you know, banning people or blocking people and things, but. It's not really enough, um, and I know you know Matt Bishop. I I sort of I, I I've had a few chats with and things, and uh, I follow him on Twitter, and he obviously gets a lot of abuse um, uh, from some people, and it's just some of the things he retweets and just says, "Oh, I blocked him." And unbelievable what they write, but you know this, this is where we're at. We need it needs to be regulated because it's it's out of control now. Yeah, um, I mean, it is out of control. There's some studies in the US about violence that compare violence to a kind of contagious disease in that if it happens to you or if it happens in your sort of presence, you're more likely to then um, perpetuate that. And maybe there's something similar there that, you know, it's almost self-perpetuating, which, you know, doesn't doesn't fill me with hope that there's an easy solution. Um, you know, <laughs> you, you, you talked a bit there about um, the top paddock and the interviews you've conducted. Uh, at Goodwood. I mean, thinking back to all those interviews, are there any where you were a bit sort of starstruck or you, you might have met a hero or, or any that were particularly memorable for you? I mean, uh, do you know what? There's, I mean, there's been so many memorable memorable ones. Uh, I mean, to put it into perspective, so this year uh, alone in the four days, I did 209 interviews. So um, there's, so I've probably done, in just in the top paddock at Goodwood, I've probably done over a thousand interviews. Um, and none of them, none of them have been disasters. Actually, this year there was a bit of a disaster. Um, there was a a drift driver. Um, oh, I can't remember his name. Hang on. 
I've got it here somewhere. Um, and he was this Japanese guy, um, and uh, he was just hilarious because he he was so committed in his drift car. And you know how people tend to work up to a level when they're racing. He basically leapt beyond the level and then worked his way back towards it over the weekend. And um, one of the drift drivers has said to me earlier in the weekend, "Is like, look, Ed, just I wouldn't interview him because he he literally speaks no English at all." Anyway, so his first run up the hill, he hits every single barrel. He hits straw bales. He just it it all goes completely wrong. Though he did it very dramatically and excitingly, but it all went wrong. So uh, Tetsu uh, Hib Hibino, yeah, that's it. And in my ear, the director says, "Ed, can you make sure you get a um uh so get an interview with Hibino?" And I so I reply saying, "Look, do you mind if we do it as a pre-record because I don't think he speaks any English at all." And the director said, oh, he doesn't speak any English. Perfect. We'll do it live. So he then throws to me live. And I have to walk up to this guy knowing he doesn't speak to then do an interview with him. And there's, I think the interview might be online somewhere. It's, it's excruciatingly embarrassing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, highlights Wayne Rainey. The um, it's quite fun to interview uh, Gordon Ramsay. He was quite amusing. Um, I don't know. It's, it's funny. I don't tend to get starstruck. Um, I, you know, every, we're all human. You know, some people have achieved success in some areas and, uh, you know, what, what some of these guys have managed is, is absolutely incredible. But at the end of the day, every, everyone wakes up and goes to bed at night. Everyone goes to the loo. Everyone eats. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're more similar than we are different. So, um, but Nigel Mansell was always pretty special, especially sat in his FW14B. That was very cool. Um, and uh, I mean, there's been loads over the over the years, but um, it's it tends to be the kind of not so much the person, but the moment. And uh, I think it was last year, or maybe in the year uh, before COVID, when Jackie Stewart came up the hill with his two sons behind him and Dario Franchitti. And he stopped on the hill and uh, got his wife, Helen, who's in a wheelchair, she's got dementia. And she came over as they were all sat on the hill with the engines ticking over. And he gave her a rose that um, uh, he had obviously had in the cockpit with him on the way up the hill. And that was the whole, everyone was just kind of blown away by the kind of the touching moment. And interviewing him at the top of the hill after that um, was very special. So yeah, it's more more moments than people, I think. And I, I was laughing uh, there um, earlier in your remarks because I, when I was looking at sort of your YouTube and your Twitter, uh, that that interview with the guy that doesn't speak English uh, was there, and I think you're sort of saying, you know, you you you, you had to pour water on your engine, yeah. uh, you know. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, I, oh, course, I think there's I knew no way it. that he can comprehend yeah. what you're asking. I know, and I also I knew exactly why he was pouring water on his radiators, as did everyone else. <laughs> but it was the one thing I could think of that had an action to it, uh, that you know might give some kind of idea as to what I was talking about. Um, and yeah, it was just uh, yeah. I, I mean, it was it was a bit of a disaster, but it made good TV, so um, <laughs> it was all fine. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't mind making a fool of myself. Um, but uh, that was particularly bad. I got tr I got royally set up on that one. <laughs> um, but actually, when you were talking about, you know, this guy hitting all the barrels on the way up and, you know, the, the typically people try, try to kind of get edged towards the limit rather than surpassing it and coming back. It reminds me that you do a bit of um, driving yourself. Is, is that right? If you, I think you've got a, do, at least yeah. one classic I, car. Yeah, yeah. So I race an uh, FIA Works MGB. Um, and I'm racing out of the revival this year, so that'd be good. Um, I uh, I think it was Dens in the in the intro was the quote from Graham Hill about how he's an artist and he um, you know the, the circuit is his canvas and his car is the paintbrush. I would say my level of racing is more kind of paint cannon, um, and it's uh, yeah. There's not a lot of artistic flair to it, but I love it. Um, and uh, it's yeah, it's, it's it's great fun. It's just, it's expensive, you know. There's no way around it. The MGB is supposed to be a relatively speaking cheap car to race, but it's just that the price is ridiculous. You know, you're you're spending 250 quid a tire, and you'll get through a set of tires in a weekend if you do a test day. So I only really do a couple of races a year because that's 
you know, it's just so expensive. Um, and but I do love it, and it's um, yeah, it's great, it's great, great fun. So hopefully it all goes well at the revival um, because I've raced at members meeting and raced at speed week, but I've never raced at revival. So to race race at the revival is kind of a, a dream come true. Um, so hopefully the car holds together because that would just be a shocker. Breakdown in practice, disaster. <laughs> Gosh, that's uh, just you know. My, even my maths will extend to knowing how many, uh, how much a, a whole set of tires would cost there. That's uh, it's incredible. But hopefully, hopefully, yeah. they give you a lot of grip. Uh, you were talking. You were sort of no, no, they don't. There's none. No? <laughs> There's absolutely none. But that's actually having no grip um, is good because you basically, you know, they you, they're called Dunlop historic, so you're always drifting. Mm. Um, it's about kind of drifting to the right level because if you get completely sideways on the apex or heaven forbid, on corner exit, you lose so much time down the next straight. But in order to carry the speed through the corner, you've, you've got to be going sideways. Um, and that's the kind of the joy of it. Um, and uh, so the car, the, basically the tyres don't grip, they don't last, and they're really expensive. So they've nailed everything. <laughs> but uh, but it's addictive enough that you keep going back to the tyre dealership and, uh, and restart. Well, no, you, you, have to, you have to run Dunlop Historics. So you can't run uh, any other tire. Yeah, yeah. So um, you're, you're stuck with it. I personally would like to see us change to Avons because they, they last better. But the historic racing all runs on these historic Dunlops. And Dunlop says that it loses money on every tire it makes for the for the historics. I I find that hard to believe, but I, I may well be wrong. Um, but it's, it's one of the most crippling costs of the mm. tires because uh, you, you just get through them. You know, heaven forbid if you run a Cobra, you're going to be through them even even quicker. You um, you were talking a little bit earlier about you know needing to be um, a Sunday to actually count your hill climb uh, against the record, and it did make me think. You talking about these tyres as well? Um, does someone have to run engineering and are there technical and sporting regs at uh, at Goodwood? Yeah, so I'd, uh, cars basically have to be kind of original. You know, you can't. I'd, I think. Um, it'd be a bit frowned upon to turn up with a sort of a group C car that's also got nitrous. It's not, it's, you know, it's not going to happen. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, I think there are obviously reasonable regulations. Um, I don't actually, I don't know. Tend to, that's, that's done by the scrutineers and things. Um, but then the, the main thing is that all the cars are safe and you, uh, it's, yeah. And I'm sure there'll be specific tires that specific cars can use so that you don't go off and just get, really sticky tires um for a pre-war car because that's it just doesn't you know it wouldn't make sense and everything would break on it but um yeah so i don't have to say i don't know the ins and outs of the, of the regs but there will definitely be some well i, I hear michael massey is looking for a job so you know if there are any vacancies <laughs> perfect perfect yeah yeah that'd be great um, <laughs> what, just, a, what a disaster that was yeah i mean <laughs> we could go on uh, about that one all day and i'm sure our yeah. listeners have Heard about that? I mean, were you were you watching that Grand Prix live um, when it was happening, or was it more the? Afternoon? I was, I was, yeah. Um, I uh, I think Max Verstappen is a very worthy champion. He he won more races. He drove he drove brilliantly. You know, there were moments of of it not quite going right. Um, but I do think Lewis Hamilton was robbed of a championship there, um, and how he will ever get over that, I don't know because. I think if he wins another championship, or not all will be forgiven, but it's the fact that he it was his eighth world championship to make him, you know, without doubt the most successful Formula One driver of all time. Um, and to have that uh, kind of taken away in in that manner, um, I thought was particularly unfair because it was just the way it, it worked and the only five cars being let through and the strategy that Max was on with his new tyres, the time in the race... Hamilton's old tyres, it couldn't have worked any worse for Hamilton or any better for Verstappen. Um, so it did feel like a very cruel way to lose it. But as I said, you know, Verstappen's a worthy. Um, and I, I think he'll probably go on to win his, his second championship this year. But um, yeah, uh, not a great day in the office for Michael Massey, that one. Um, well, uh, it was a human error, so I hear, according to the FIA report. Um, well, do, do, you know what? Go on, go on. do you know what I have to say hats off to them for saying human error because so we run a cafe up in, here in Scotland and I had to do a health and safety document for it and the 
uh, I, so you basically what you do is you you nick one offline, and you then change it so it suits your business. Mm -hmm. So the one I downloaded, it said there is no such thing as an accident. And I just thought, oh my god, what kind of world are we living in? And actually, no one will admit a mistake now. And it's one of the most infuriating things I come across in my life. And I'm always, if I make a mistake, I'm the first to put my hand up and say, I'm so sorry, I, I, I made a mistake. And people do. The fact that Michael Massey made his, at the deciding race of the FIA 2021 Formula One World Championship, not a great one. Um, mm. Would have been better if he made the mistake at like Super Stocks at Cowden Beath or something in Scotland. But um, yes, it's... Uh, you know, I, I, I like it when people say, do you know what? It was human error. We made a mistake. I quite like that because no one ever says it anymore. Everyone's always pointing the fingers like, oh, well, you know, it was this system or that system or, yeah. Anyway, rant over. Sorry. You no, I think, I think that's fair enough. There are no accidents. Okay, well, we'll talk to the uh, Scottish, uh, I don't know what the organization would be, but some sort of food. Well, the kind of, you know, there'll be, I, I can't remember what the um, health and safety document was off now. But I just, it just blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind um, yeah. that as someone could say there's no such thing as an accident. The thing well, is, is mean, nowadays you're, you're not allowed to trip over. The reason why you tripped over is because there was a little bit of payment that wasn't 100% perfect. Um, and that's mentality I find very frustrating. But anyway. Let me, let me ask you two quick, uh, quick fire motorsport questions. And then, then we'll take the interview in a slightly uh, different turn. But before we do... Um, you, you, you obviously follow historic cars. You, you've clearly got a real passion for it. Um, could you, you know, what's your favourite car? It's probably impossible to list, but if you, if you picked one and maybe a road car and one, one in terms of Formula One, do you have a favourite era, favourite design, favourite manufacturer? Yes. <laughs> do you know what? This is my, my brother and I raced with each other once a year and he comes and races the MGB with me and invariably we end up playing the game of, right, you're allowed three road cars, three race cars. Or you're allowed one road car, one race car, um, and so this, this just reminds me of that game. Um, I think so. I tend to think about things I'd like to use or I could use. So I'm not really that interested in a modern Formula One car in the sense that I won't fit in it. I can't drive it. I can't race it. It's too expensive to run. It's an amazing piece of engineering, incredibly fast. But actually, for me, it doesn't hold a huge amount of interest. Um, I love 60s sports cars. They're just some of the most beautiful bits of machinery in, in the world. Um, I love the Group C cars. Uh, they they just look like racing cars. They look how like racing cars should. Um, and then uh, road car wise, again, I'm I'm just keen on the historics. You know, I I find. I don't really have much interest in owning a modern supercar. Um, I've actually, that said, I've got a, a first generation Audi R8. Um, and because I, it was the first supercar I ever, ever drove uh, when I was working at Motorsport Magazine. And I, uh, I can't remember where I went in it. But anyway, it was the first kind of supercar I drove. And I remember thinking at the time, I love this, but the sad thing is I'll never, ever be able to afford one. <coughs> and actually, the first rates of got down in value so much that I bought one two years ago that was cheaper than a Golf. Um, and it's only on 30,000 miles. And my thinking is that if I hold on to it for 10 years, I should be able to use an R8 for free. And it's not kind of modern day supercar quick. It's, you know, it's, it's sprightly, but you can drive it like a normal road car. So it's really cool. Um, but favorite road car. Uh, can I have quite, can I go for quite a niche one? Is that okay? Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Jaguar built, I think it was 13 lightweight Jaguar E types for racing. Um, and they're worth, you know, huge amounts of money now. Um, what's lesser known built an extra one for a guy called Sir Henry Ropner. And he called up the factory and said, I want one of those lightweight racing cars, but as a road car. And, uh, so they built this road car to factory lightweight, um, specification and for he bought it off someone who had no idea what it was he he basically swapped it for his road going v12 e type and this um Ropner car was in bits well, I, I remember my my mum saying she was particularly cross because he he drove off in a 
beautiful road going V12E type and came back with a trailer full of bits. Um, anyway, uh, he had that for oh, 30 years or something. And it was just the most amazing car. It was quick. It looked beautiful. Um, and to me, and we had to sell it, you know, to pay for things on the farm um, back in, I think, 2011. Uh, and I think Sir Anthony Bamford now owns it of JCB. And I did email him a while ago saying, if you ever want to sell it, I'd love to buy it back. Not that I'll ever be able to afford it, but um, that I think is the kind of perfect road car because it was just, it was, it was the business. Um, and then it's kind of perfect race car. <sighs> As the problem is, is because I race, I want, I want something I can actually afford to race. So that, I'd say, you know, MGB, I love, I love my racing MGB because it is, reasonably affordable i can do it um whereas if i bought a 1970s formula one car uh, or heaven forbid a 1990s one or a 2005 um you know uh machine i just simply couldn't afford to run it so it'd be rather sad yeah you see those teams of mechanics that follow around um you know some of the some of the f1 cars like the the old lotuses or, or whatever you'd have to hire uh, an entourage i suppose um, yeah, I mean, I, the, the V10 era is the worst because that was the, the sort of height of manufacturer spending. So manufacturers are turning up with lorries full of engines and they just, you know, put new engines in all the time. So if you own a V10 era Formula One car, um, you need a team of people to run the engine, let alone the car, which which doesn't sound like much fun. I think Christmas would be cancelled if you had to run a V10 Formula One car. It makes two pound two pound fifty. It makes two hundred and fifty pound a tire sound pretty reasonable. Um, yes, well, exactly. Yeah, I rest my case. I rest my shaky case. <laughs> let, let me ask you one more um, motorsport question, and then you almost spoiled the the question after that. Which so the question is, um, you, you sort of uh, in a very British way, self deprecatingly sort of didn't compare yourself to a particular artist. But thinking about your driving style, is there a famous driver that you you happen to emulate? That you have a style that's quite similar to no i i there's i don't i have to say i don't emulate anyone who's any good um i i i, I think it's I'm, I'm sort of reasonably quick in the mgb i'm not kind of you know oh my god quick at all there's there's people that are out there much quicker than me um but i i suppose it's quite dramatic my driving style because i tend to basically throw it in and see what happens which invariably doesn't end with a perfect result but I much prefer kind of sliding around and having a good time. I'm not, I'm by no, I think what I'm trying to say is I'm not very precise and my throttle application is quite binary. <laughs> so, but I definitely wouldn't compare myself to anyone. Not quite as smooth as Jensen Button, but you know, you, no, you do your best. I mean, I mean, very similar, but just not quite as smooth. Yeah. <laughs> very similar to Alan Prost. I mean, actually, in, in, in fact, at Goodwood, Alan Prost came up to me and said, Oh, Edward, no, I, I'm not going to do an Alan Prost impression. Um, anyway, so yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's that's for the after show uh, when you do yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me ask you one final question and in so doing, I'll hand over to Dens. And that's uh, in one of your previous answers, you referred to the farm. And when I looked at your, um, on your Twitter, before it even said anything about motorsport, it said farming. So could you tell yes, us a little bit about your connection to that? Yeah, so um, my mum and dad moved to Fife in the 70s, um, at Fife up in Scotland, and uh, my father was a farmer um, all his life. And uh, so, uh, yes, I basically, when I left Goodwood, I left Goodwood because my dad had Parkinson's with Louis body dementia, and I, I basically needed to be up here helping to run the farm and the various other businesses, the clay shooting ground, cafe, event space, um, livery stables, uh gym um and they just kind of needed attention so that's why i then left and do the freelancing um nowadays so i would say my time is basically 80 percent farm and 20 percent freelance kind of tv writing kind of stuff. so uh so yes yeah, so the farm we basically it's an arable farm uh so we farm uh barley wheat all seed rape oats for the first time this year and then we let out land for potatoes, carrots, and some fruit. Um, and so we've actually, we have just, well, we've started harvest now. So we've done the barley um, and cut all that. And that is, I'm just trying to put the last load. So when I finish this, I'm going back out to the dryer and I'm trying to get the last load of barley into the dryer 
So it then basically dries it down. Getting quite geeky here, but about 13% moisture content. And then that goes into the shed. Um, some of it's sold already. So that'll be taken away on lorries. And then others will sit on for a bit and sell kind of as and when uh, the price is, mm -hmm. price is good. And then we'll be starting the oats and then the oilseed rape and then a lot of wheat. So we, get, we do about uh, 1,500 tons of wheat a year. Um, so it's kind of all hands to the pump until I would say end of August, beginning, beginning of September, depending on how we get on. So yeah, it's it's a busy time at the moment. I'll tag over to my friend Dens, uh, and as I do, I mean, motorsport and farming. The only other association I can make is Jeremy Clarkson. Um, <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> so <we>? funny, <laughs> funny you should mention. I've never met the guy, um, but we both. Um, used to be motoring journalists who then ended up farming. Um, we're both divorced and we're now going out with Irish people called Lisa. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And we both tried to diversify the farm with a farm shop slash cafe. Uh, but I've never, I'd, I'd love to meet him because actually uh, we've both been doing the same thing um, just to opposite ends of the country. Yeah, well, I mean, as long as you weren't copying him like for like and and, and potentially uh, coming to a sticky end with one of your employers. Um, other than that, I yeah, I'm not. I'd, I'd, I'd like to say that all, all the things I mentioned. That's those are all the similarities. Um, <laughs> I uh, let's just make that very clear. Um, I don't have his um, uh, sort of what, what's the his shape status. I'm trying to think of a good way to put it. Quite yet. Um, it may well come in the next 20 years, but uh, yeah, that's where all the similarities finish. Thank okay, you for that. Uh, uh, no, so thank you, Black, as well. Yeah, oh, I'm going to come into this round to show off, essentially. But we have got one, like, we call it like the fantasy kind of uh, segment, Ed. So please bear with us for this. But right. one of our fans have asked us, like, they've given a hypothetical situation. And they wanted to see what your response would be to it. So the hypothetical situation is, is that Andretti Autosport get granted an entry into Formula One in 2023, for example. And they put you as the team principal and the question is essentially who would you pick as the two drivers to star in the team as you know you've come across and interviewed many drivers as part of your role on the goodwood festival of speed kind of a tv aspect of things yeah but also which brands would you pick as the sponsors for the for well andretti autosport as well being the team principal uh okay so um i'm a firm believer in actually basically you want a driver to be very fast um they've got to be rounded but quite i don't really necessarily want somebody who's good at pr or anything like that. you know they just need to be so really in terms of kind of the current drivers you know in turn in, in that sort of top level you've got hamilton you've got verstappen you've got um leclerc you've got i think george russell is knocking on the door as well to, you know going by what people say about him so it have to be one of it has to be those one of those four or two of those four, depending on, have I, are you putting a budget on this, by the way? Or can I just throw um, as much money as, as I want at it? Money is no object here, Ed. And also I was going to say as well is they don't even necessarily have to be an F1 driver on the current grid. They could be any driver from any period of time in any discipline of racing as well. Oh, wow. So not even like, a, 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 they don't even have to be, be alive. No, that's correct as well. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. I, um, uh he'd have to go for sterling moss um i think he is arguably the greatest racing driver that ever lived um what in emilia was extraordinary um so that would be one um and then a slightly lesser known one i would go stefan beloff just because he's not a lot of people kind of know about stefan beloff but he was unbelievably quick and he was killed when he was quite young um but he was known to sort of always push the envelope um and he was a very good sports car racer and every driver that i've talked to have always, has always said he was just amazingly fast um so i'd love to see what he could do in a formula one car uh sponsors andretti autosport uh do you know what I do well. You don't really get to could kind of request your sponsors, do you? You, I think you'd end up having to take whoever you could get. But mm -hmm. it'd be nice to have something that wasn't too serious. Um, 
the uh, do you, those sort of those Top Gear ones when they had Peniston oils and things like that. <laughs> I'm not I'm not thinking that much of a joke. Um, t- I tell you what, Seven Up would be a great one, just because it, you could go back to that Jordan livery, the Seven Up livery. Uh, yeah, with Michael the one, the one, well. one. Just mm-hmm. uh, stunning car, really cool livery. Martini always a winner, but doesn't look it didn't look that good on the Williams when they had it a few couple of years ago. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, the, it's the uh, the Canon, um, the Williams livery. Cool. My my problem with the liveries is that they only look cool twenty years later, and actually at the time you don't appreciate a really good livery. Certainly, I don't. Um, I I always think you look back uh, and think liveries were perhaps. Um, better than you thought at the time, but yeah, I think seven up. I'd go. Yeah, that would... yeah, I, I agree with you. And you know, talking on the seven up kind of uh, sponsorship as well, like it's been so legendary in terms of like the Eddie Jordan car. I think Sky Sports did like a feature with Mick Schumacher a couple of months ago around Silverstone, where he drove like Michael's car, and just to see just how that car is, and it, this livery hasn't aged at all. This goes to show, like you said, that some liveries, they really stand the test of time and they just become really iconic in terms of folklore or story. And there's, there's been some amazing ones you mentioned as well, like the Martini livery or even just like the black and gold Lotus liveries of yeah. the day. There's so many interesting ones. And on that note, Ed, it's been amazing to have you on the show. We really need to get you back again, you know, hopefully before the next good word or perhaps towards maybe the, the end of the year when we can do like a review of this, all the different series and, and F1 and, and just generally what's going on at the time as well. But just for those at home, where can they find you? And have you got any interesting or any new projects that, uh, you know, you haven't announced quite yet or you're going to be working on in the future that we can look forward to? No, well, so next up is the Silverstone Classic. Um, at the end, uh, well, near the end of August, uh, so I'll be work- working at the Revival, racing at Revival, um, and then so we've got a fair bit of written work. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's the kind of next motorsport things on the list. Um, uh, so yeah, I've got no books to plug, got no TV series to plug. Um, I, uh, but I would say to anyone who hasn't hasn't been to Goodwood, you know, if, at the very least, like watch some of the past kind of clips of it and things like that to get an idea of what it is but do try and get tickets because it is um it is an amazing event it's worth worth going to see absolutely ed and on top of that they can find you as well on twitter at at another ed foster which i think is amazing as well because when i think of ed foster you're the first person that comes to mind so yeah <laughs> there's, <laughs> great many great more. Username, there's many more yeah. <laughs> well, you're the original, so we're going to keep you yeah. on the top of the pinnacle there. And our final question is actually come in from our, well, you know, our kind of leader being uh, Georgina. We touched earlier on your time when you are in Milan and you are doing work for Autocar too. So, you know, you, you're quite familiar with the Tifosi and this pesky Italians. Georgina's question to round the show up was, pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Absolute nay. No, I can't have that. It's, it should be banned. It's a no, a massive no. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Ed, honestly, it's been such a pleasure to have your time as well. And, you know, being able to chat with you and get insight, you know, into such niche things as well. Because I think for, you know, Goodwood, people need to appreciate that that is such an iconic landmark show. You know, it's here every single year as well. So even if you get to, even if you missed out on it or you you look at some of the YouTube footage and you're like, ah, I wish I could be there. There's no excuse for not going next year, as you mentioned. So we employ everybody listening to try and check it out if you're in the UK and if you can make it down, please do. And then, uh, Ed, any any final words before we wrap up the show? No, just uh, thank you to you guys uh, for having me on. Um, I'm not very good at sort of uh, talking about myself because I'm always asking the questions. So um, I hope it wasn't uh, wasn't too boring. <laughs> no, Ed, it was absolutely fascinating. And then actually, I think we'll need a, a update on your farm as well as the year progresses too, just to see how things are going and maybe how the budget is for those uh, those tires. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the budget is never really there, but you spend it anyway. <laughs> that's the best logic to go by Ed, honestly <laughs> oh well thank you so much and to everybody at home as well tuning in to this legendary episode of Stripping the Dipping whilst Georgina's dog emphatically barks in the background <laughs> been AMG Dens and F1 Black as well another legend we hope that you enjoy it make sure of course you follow Ed Foster as well on Twitter and all social media platforms too 
And as always, um, huge love and support. And thanks to all of you guys tuning in. And until next time, peace.